Okay, thanks very much. Oh. That is right, I'll be talking about basic core dynamics. Outline of the talks at all first, just briefly discuss the geodynamo. Then the heart of it will basically be a discussion of rotating fluid dynamics. Um, that'll take up most of the talk. And then maybe if we get to it at the end, we'll get to core coupling. Um, and I think that last point is actually the most important. Not that we'll get to core coupling, maybe we'll get to it. Give me your questions, ask away. I really don't care if I get to the end of the talk. I honestly don't. I want a lot of questions. This talk is not even for the dynamicist. It's for everybody else who's not a dynamicist. So if there's anything you don't get, just ask. Now's your, now's your chance. Okay, I'm gonna show probably far too many movies in this talk. Um, if they're interesting to you or if there's a good point in there for you, we have many more online at uh, YouTube, Spin Lab, UCLA. Go check them out. If you watch them like 10 or 20 times in a row, you'll become assimilated. You'll think it's true, which is <laughs> all we need. Um, and then in addition, if they're of use to you, you can download a number of them. I've been a little lazy putting them online, but some of them are on uh, the UCLA page and you can just download them and really in high resolution and do whatever the hell you want with them. Okay, Dynamo. So, the fundamental point is that with dynamos, somehow these devices generate their own magnetic fields and then continually regenerate them, okay? Be they a planet or a lab experiment, that is the goal. And this is inherently, in our world, a magneto-hydrodynamic process. So it's an interaction between fluid dynamics and electricity and magnetism. And I'd argue the fundamental definition is that a dynamo converts kinetic energy of moving electrical conductor somehow into magnetic field energy, okay? That's the game. How do we do that conversion? And we won't really handle that today. Today we'll worry about more the motions and tomorrow I'll give a talk and I'll talk maybe about how we do the conversion a little better. So what do we see when we look at the radial magnetic field on the core mantle boundary. We have pretty good data over about the past 400 years. Little low resolution, obviously, at the start. So you'll see the resolution increase in time. But you'll also see that the field clearly is changing on relatively short time scales. It's very active, breathing in various ways. And yet, predominantly, there's magnetic field coming out the southern hemisphere and going back in in the northern hemisphere, right? It's an axial dipole dominant field with many smaller scale structures within that. Yeah, Beth. Hang on, hang on. Sorry. I'm going to run around. Um, the, it seems like the, the wave number character of this reconstruction changes with time. Is that just due to the availability of data, or do yeah. we think that there are? Yeah, yeah, here you're looking at satellite data, uh -huh. and at, you know, if we go back in time, you're looking at ship track data that Andy Jackson and Jeremy Bloxham harvested by hand. And that's miserable coverage. That's horrific coverage. This is, 400 years later, global coverage. And you might say, yeah, it still doesn't look very good. It doesn't look very good because we're still a mantle away from the core. And it's a potential field, so it's falling off very quickly with radius. So since it's falling off very quickly with radius, we've got the, the mantle shower curtain problem. We'll never see through that shower curtain. God knows what's on the other side of that, whatever that, that Thanks, wall Jim. is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're stuck. This is about L equals 13 or 14. And until we get much, much sneakier, we're going to be there. OK. So somehow we've got, again, this fluid system generated, generating a dynamo. And the question is, where's that kinetic energy come from? Where's the flow coming from? And I'm not really going to answer that today. It's one of the hot topics right now in Earth dynamics is, is this a thermal system? Is this thermally driven? Is this chemically driven? Is this driven from inner core nucleation? Is it driven from mantle exsolution? Is it not convective? 
Maybe there's mechanical driving. Irrespective, I'm going to honestly just skip that for time's sake. And I'm going to say somehow there's motion inside the core. And I'm going to present to you the, the dominant paradigm presently in the, in the literature. And that is that there's some form of convection, probably compositionally dominated, and that that convection occurs in the form of axial helical plumes. So these aligned flow structures. These are, this is showing what's called Z vorticity. Vorticity just means how the fluid swirling, and Z means along the rotation axis. And you can see these are up and down aligned swirls, blue being actually down, red up. Okay? And so that's very beautiful. We'd think it'd be massively turbulent, and it is, and yet there's probably some alignment to that turbulence. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, just like if you want to think about it, if you could look from above, if we could take a slice through the equator, here would be blue, here would be red. Fluid's moving out that way, right? So as that goes, that's going to generate that map, since it's roughly aligned axially, that generates these long columns. And I'll, I'll talk about this as we go. OK? OK. So in the models, what you see is that we have these big, roughly helical columns. They're massive in the models. And associated with those are magnetic flux patches. Hopefully, I'll get that far tomorrow. And so there is a mapping between these large scale structures and the large scale field. And that was brief. And that is the zeroth order picture is that we have these large scale flows, axial columns. Somehow they twist up the magnetic field. I'll mainly talk about that tomorrow. So the question then for me today is how do we get those flows? Why are those the flows that are there, or that we argue are there? Let's go over that fluid physics then. Oh, but before I do it, I thought I'd mention just one other planet. Juno just went into orbit two days ago. If we're going to talk about basic planetary core physics, this is every bit as delightful of a planet. And talk about deep flow. My heart's all pitter-patter for Juno. It is. That is an incredible body. We've got huge jets on the surface, massive gas planet, no CMB. We simply go from insulating uh, hydrogen helium to semiconducting into conducting. There's a good chance the dynamos talking to the atmosphere is even talking to the cloud deck. That's amazing. So one of the questions then is, here's the magnetic field right now as measured on Jupiter out to about degree four. If Juno survives and gets good data, we'll probably have uh, information almost up to degree 20. So we're going to have a significantly better snapshot of Jupiter's magnetic field than we will of Earth's. That's going to be awesome. And so if you're going to make predictions for how planetary dynamos work, this is the one. Here, here we could actually make predictions and test them within the next year or two. Yeah. OK, so um, earlier when you sketched what you expected the convection or what the models for the pattern of convection in the outer core is, you, you, you sketched those uh, cylinders uh, that are aligned with the rotation axis. But um, so how should I think about the clouds on Jupiter? It's a rapidly rotating planet, <clears throat> and it's turbulent. The atmosphere is turbulent. But yet what we seem to see is bands of, of the loss. Yeah. Well, it, it's a mixture, actually, of bands and vortical structures. Um, I pr I'm not going to get this far. I'm not really going to talk about jets today. Great thing to talk about. But I'm mainly going to focus on columns. Still, what you get with jets, um, let's, let's put it this way. If you put a jet in a relatively thin shell, then boundary topography will have an effect. It'll actually tip the column a little bit. Um, and that tipping fluxes angular momentum out. That is not an answer, but that is what happens. And so, yeah, that's way above today. That would be, for me, another 90-minute talk. I've given a talk on that for 90 minutes. It's not for today. But it's very natural in rapidly rotating systems to get large-scale vortices, and a lot of times the vortices will naturally shear out into jets. So this is a fundamental part of these systems 
And what's actually interesting is almost the other way. It doesn't look like right now there are massive jets in Earth's core. I don't know why not. I'm actually a little confused by that. Maybe the magnetic field kills them. But you'd think they'd be there. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Could you please describe what you mean by jets? Oh, yeah. Great. Good. Thanks. So if you look at the surface pattern, <laughs> uh, here goes my whole talk. So if you, uh, um, if you watch the surface um, pattern of clouds on Jupiter for any amount of time, right? Let's say we take data over even a couple months. Um, you'll see that these cloud features are drifting this way and this way and this way and this way. And there are, on time average, jets, which mean coherent flow structures that are oriented east-west. And they're wrapping around the planet like belts. And you can see there are about 30 of them. On Earth, we have jets as well. We have the jet stream, right? We have trade winds. But here you have much stronger jets, order 100 meters per second. And there are like 30 of them. And that scale scales with the strength of rotation in these systems. So the strength of rotation is much greater on Jupiter. And you get a whopper load of jets, to be technical. You good? OK. How about I get back to it later? That's the Rossby number. It's the velocity measured relative to the uh, velocity of the equator of the planet. So it's how fast are the velocities relative to the rotation velocity. OK. So all right. So Jupiter is delightful as well. And now let's get to the fluids. And the fluids hold on really any rotating body with relatively low viscosity fluid. And our goal is to get some clue as to how these dynamics are functioning. So the way we're going to do that is through a bunch of differencing experiments. I'm going to attempt to build up some basic intuition by doing four different experiments. We did them in the lab a couple years ago. And we're going to show them step by step and just walk through. And as we do, we'll kind of increase in complexity. Again, they, hopefully they'll make sense as we go. If not, just stop me. What we're going to do in doing that is we're going to build up the rotating knob your Stokes equation, so the momentum equation in a rotating frame. It is a miserable and horrible equation. But by doing differences, it's always going to remain, I hope, tractable. Okay. The other, I think, even more important thing is we're going to really simplify it by taking an unbearably heuristic approach, in which case I'm going to often be checking what's the shortest time scale process. Because the shortest process, the shortest time scale, usually means the most rapid acceleration. Right? This is a momentum equation. This is change in momentum in time. So if the time scale is short, that's on the denominator. That means that term is big. So the shortest time scale is usually the dominant force in the system. And I'm going to argue it's the dominant process. Is everybody with me on that? So I'll be mentioning time scales a good amount. OK, here's the, the setup. We've got, let's see, I think this is a movie John Bridgman made. Yep, we'll kind of play it. I don't think I can speed it up. But there's a square tank. It's on a rotating table. It's got a fluorescent light panel in the rotating frame. It's got a couple of GoPros, one on the side, one kind of oblique. Yeah, there's the side view. There's the oblique view. Um, the, yeah, yeah, we got a die pump in there. So there's a die pump in the rotating frame with a remote control on it. That's fun. And those, that's where the die injects. There's one of the injectors. Are we going to show it dropping? And it drops die. Lime green, maybe Kelly green die. It's just creamer that we put a little green food coloring in so we could see it well. And so it's a little denser. It's about 5% denser than water. So it'll fall through water, and it'll definitely fall through air. And then when we worry about rotation, we'll spin the whole thing. And so then we can add all those forces. And we'll usually turn the lights off so that you can't tell what frame you're in, right? So that's just we're just living in that rotating frame. It's just the physics is in there. And so when we turn the lights off, also, you don't get nauseous by watching the background move. And that's actually important. Yeah? Why don't you rotate a cylinder rather than a square? It, it actually doesn't matter. 
for the basic fluid dynamics. And actually, I'll go the other way. It's a little quicker to do the experiments in a square because what the square does is it grabs all the fluid and spins it up. If you do a cylinder, there's no topographic torque on the fluid. So you have to wait sometimes two or three times longer before you run each experiment. So the boundary, the, the square is just kind of boundary. Uh, oh, yeah. affect the dynamics? No, once, good question. So once the fluid, I'll go through that. Once the fluid is all spun up, it doesn't care about the container at zeroth order. Not for the experiments we're going to do. I'll talk later about when the container matters. But for the simple experiments we're first going to do, no, container doesn't matter at all. And we just want the fluid to spin up and all be living in that rotating frame, right? Earth's been spinning for billions of years. All the fluid knows Earth is spinning, right? It's not like we just turned on the tank. So the quicker we can get it spun up, the happier we are. Square tank helps us do that. It also gives us better optics. That makes sense? OK. So all right, here are the experiments we're going to do. We'll do. First, some just droplets. So we'll just be letting drops out of our dye ports into air. We'll do that first, just not rotating. Then we'll rotate the thing in air, no water. Then we'll redo the whole thing with water in our tank. You guys with me? So four different experiments, non-rotating air, rotating air, non-rotating with water, and then rotating with water. Good? OK, so experiment one. The empty tank. Just air in the tank, and we're just going to drop some dye. OK, ready? Let's see. This is going to be exciting. Oh, look at that. You drop it, and it drops. Sci science. Oh, slow-mo from John Bridgman. He's so great. OK, so there it is. It's falling in slow motion. Actually, there's a lot of physics there. Um, one, it's a drop, right? We have surface tension here. When we go to water later, you'll see a very different structure. You won't have a drop when you drop it in water. But OK, so we've got these drops. They fall very nicely. The drop time is about 0.3 seconds. And let's do a little fluid dynamics. So we've got this thing accelerating as it falls across the tank. That's the acceleration at a fixed location in time. And that's the spatial derivative. Okay. And what's balancing that, just gravity here. And you can say, no, 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 there's air friction, there's this and that. You're right, there is. But we're going to simplify and just worry about gravity. We'll assume it's, a, it's close to a, a vacuum in there, which it's not. OK, so let's just scale this. We're, again, being very heuristic here. So let's scale. There's the acceleration as this particle accelerates downward through space. And what's doing that acceleration is gravity. You can see that the density drops out. Density is on both sides, so it doesn't matter. And we then, if we scale it, arrive at this relationship. Why? Because you have, just to be clear, I don't know if anyone can see over here, but why is that? If we, just so you guys get an idea, we have u dot grad u, that's u squared over the height of the tank. That's the rough scaling. Here, here. Can you guys see? <laughs> Sorry. Um, can people see over there? That's miserable of me. Um, OK. And that's simply being balanced by g. Thank you. That's fine. And that's being balanced by g. So if I now just solve, then I get u is square root of g h. Right? That's my estimated velocity. And if I worry about the time then to fall, the time would be h over u would then scale as square root of h over g. So it looks kind of like a pendulum, right? And that is called the free fall time. So I don't know if that fit on. Yeah, maybe we go a little on. Great. So those are free fall estimates. And if you plug in numbers, it's about 0.1 seconds. So we're almost, we're off by about a factor of two in our estimate. And yet we're order of magnitude. You say, oh yeah, I did forget about friction. Forgot about air drag. I left out lots of stuff. But order of magnitude, that is what's happening. It's just falling. It's falling pretty fast. Make sense? Good. OK. So now let's do it again. 
But now let's rotate the tank. And so now we spin the tank up to, I think, 40 RPM. Turn off the lights. And we get these new forces. If we now transform into the rotate, rotating frame, then we still have gravity down. Right? It's still, now it's down, minus rho g, we're paying attention, versus a centrifugal force out. So now there's a centrifuge in play. That's an omega squared s term. So s is cylindrical radius. Farther out we are, stronger this is. And we have Coriolis acceleration, which is constantly moving things off to the side. Okay? So these last two terms are, are non-inertial forces. But if we transform into that frame, that's what we get. Right? Those exist in that frame, in that description. Okay, so one thing we can do is we can lump together those two into an effect of gravity. Okay? We can say, well, this we can write as a potential, and this you can write as a potential, so we can lump them into one potential. And you could then think, everybody knows that. You do that, that carnival ride, and if it goes fast enough, you get stuck on the wall. Yeah, if you centrifuge hard enough, the centrifugal gravity dominates lab gravity, and you get stuck to the wall, right? So we're not going to centrifuge that hard, but we will see the effect of that. I think is that playing. Yeah. So there's the non-rotating path. If we rotate at 40 RPM, and we're off by, I forget how far, 15 centimeters from the axis, then the prediction is that dashed red line. And it, it nails it, right? So you push out the path of the fluid. So it falls off to the side due to, court, due to centrifugal. And if we look now on our oblique camera at the same experiment, you can see a bunch of stuff hits the bottom and then moves out. And as it moves out, you can see it gets curved off to its right. And that's because of U cross 2 omega. That's Coriolis. So the fact that it gets pushed off through the air, that allows you to pretty well see centrifugal. The fact that it gets pushed to the side on the bottom allows you to see Coriolis. Okay? All right, now, I think I did time scales. Yeah. So the time scale for the drop, John Bridgman measured it. It was, again, about 0.3 seconds. The rotation time at 40 RPM is 1.5 seconds. So the drop time is much faster than the rotation time. So if we're going to then argue in terms of time scales, we can then come back to that Rossby number. There's another way to formulate the Rossby number, which is rotation time over basically advection time or motional time scale. And this is much larger than this, which means this wins. So it also means the Rossby number is much greater than 1. When the Rossby number is greater than 1, rotational forces don't dominate. Okay. So gravity wins here. And you say, oh no, I saw all these things happen to the path. Eh, yeah, a little bit. It tweaked it a little bit. But they weren't fundamentally massive changes to the flow field. OK? Any questions? You guys with me? All right. OK, so now let's add fluid. OK, so now we're looking at the same exact tank. But now we've put in, I don't remember, I think, about a little more than 15 centimeters of water. You can kind of see the water line up there. Um, it's right there. There's the water line. So our dye injectors are just under the surface of the water. And let's see. And so now, first, we're not going to do anything yet. Let's just consider the layer of water itself. What's it doing in that picture? It is sitting there. There's nothing driving the motion. It's stationary. So this is the hydrostatic problem, right? And so if it's hydrostatic, then the u's are all 0. There's no velocity, right? So I can throw away the left-hand side. And so then I have u is balanced by minus rho of the water times g in the z-hat direction. That is not 0. That is not 0. That is order 1. So the left-hand side is 0 and the right-hand side isn't. That's totally impossible, right? That's impossible. We have to invoke something else. We have to have pressure. Pressure has to kick in. There has to be a hydrostatic pressure field holding up the fluid, right? 
if it's not there, basically the world would end. It'd be awesome. Okay, so we need that. That is going to be there to establish hydrostatic balance. We'll have increasing pressure with depth. And if we then worry about a drop of creamer falling through that water, what we can now do is we can now worry about the acceleration of the creamer, and we can subtract out the hydrostatic pressure field. And when we do, that gives us this term in front of the gravity. It's the difference between the density of the creamer and the density of the water. And we've taken away the hydrostatic part of the pressure, and we just have the dynamic pressure. Okay. So that's really different. If the density of the creamer is close to that of the water, this will be a much smaller term than before. And so we expect that to be about a factor of 5% of the other case. The creamer is about 1.05 the density of water. So then if you do all the same arguments, then you now get this change or this delta in density divided by the density itself. So a modified gravity, as it's sometimes called. And then everything else is the same. But so this is a small term. And so you expect the time scale for the fall to go way up. And that's what happens. So you pulse in your die. And now it slowly falls across the layer. Right, and it falls only due to the excess density of the creamer. If the creamer was less dense than water, of course it'd float. But it's denser, so it sinks. And it falls over, instead of 0.3 seconds, it falls in about 6 seconds. Now, let's look at that one more time. Another difference, and it really is a big physical difference, is before, oh, sorry, I lost it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Apologies. OK, there's our movie. Do we have drops? We don't have drops. This is basically heavy water through less heavy water. There's no surface tension. You don't get droplets. And instead, you get a much larger structure as the two fluids intermingle. That's also going to slow down this process. So the actual time measured is not six seconds. Oh, sorry, the actual time measured is six seconds. The predicted time is one second. So the fact that this spread out and had a big plume head definitely affected the fall time here. OK? All right. So now let's go to a rotating tank. So we're now going to spin up our tank. This is Shiji, what you were asking about. We're going to spin it up. And we want to spin it up all the way till it's equilibrated. And so that takes, in a cylindrical tank, that takes it roughly 30 minutes. In this tank, and it might take more than 30 minutes. Um, it would, so it would take even more than 30 minutes. Here it took like 15. So it's at least a factor of two because we've got these handles in the corners to grab the fluid by, kind of increase the spin up. OK, so wait, actually, yep, yep, OK. And so the. A lot of times you see in the rotating fluid dynamics community, you'll see the Ekman number listed. It's the ratio of the rotation time and the viscous diffusion time. So viscous diffusion is some length scale squared over the viscous diffusivity. So it'll typically be the height of that layer squared over kinematic viscosity. And the rotation time is the rotation time. And for this experiment, it's about 10 to the minus 5. So you'd expect then that, in that sense, viscous effects don't matter much. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we do wait for a long time, we get this solution. We get this beautiful paraboloid on the free surface. And this is, again, hydrostatic. We need to get to hydrostatic before we do any experiments. right? If it's still spinning up, we're just doing a different problem. We aren't done with the transient. So we let the whole thing spin up. And we get this beautiful paraboloid. And now the hydrostatic balance problem is pressure versus lab gravity plus centrifugal. And it's that outward centrifuge that's giving us the parabola. So if we just look at it, you can do it component-wise. In the vertical, we still need vertical hydrostatic balance. So dp dz is minus rho g. And if we solve that, we just see we have atmospheric pressure at the surface. And then increasing pressure with depth, right? Rho, G, and whatever the local 
height of the layer is as you go down through it. So that's the pressure at the bottom. And now, if you worry about horizontally, now you have to have that pressure field balance, or the gradient in that pressure field, balance centrifugal force. So what I could do is I can sub this solution into here. Atmospheric pressure is a constant. It'll drop out. Rho is constant. G is constant. So only H can vary horizontally. So if I stick that in, I'll have dH dS equals this. I can integrate. And I'll get the height at the center of the tank plus some constant times s squared. So there's my parabola. Okay, So I have to get a parabolic surface. And the shape of that parabola is controlled by how fast I'm rotating. It's just omega squared over 2g. So it's just rotation versus gravity. Makes sense? And so the cool thing is, in this solution, that surface, that parabola, is a surface on which the horizontal forces are zero. It's just like it's an equipotential surface. Just like right now, this is an equipotential surface. If I drop something, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to roll one way or the other. Same thing on there. If I just placed a little object on there, hypothetically, it would just sit there. Right? Because centrifugal is balancing gravity on that surface. If they weren't, it'd move the parabola a little more. Does that make sense? OK. Yes, exactly. OK. So now let's do an experiment. Now we're going to drop dye. And when we do, we're going to worry about basically this equation. We got that, acceleration. We've got our buoyancy times our effective gravity. We've got our pressure gradient. And we've got Coriolis. OK. Let's see what happens. Shaky tank. I don't know why that was a shaky tank, but the movie's still OK. And we drop the die, and it falls straight down. It doesn't get pushed over. It falls slowly. And then it hits the bottom. And I should have shown a longer movie. And it basically sets up shop. So we get these tall, axially aligned columns. It's weird. So why is that happening? Now we're in the regime where the rotation time is shorter than the drop time. So the drop took actually is slightly longer. You've slightly slowed down the fluid mechanics by rotating quickly. And so the drop time is now almost seven seconds. Rotation time is only two seconds. So when the rotation time is faster than the drop time, what we find is that Coriolis dominates the system. And so when Coriolis dominates the system, weird things happen. And so the Rossby number now is less than one. Yeah. It looks like you don't get the same uh, plume head kind of entrainment. No. Oh, no. Well, why is that? Oh, that's such a good question. Can I, can I answer? Well, you can wait. <laughs> no, I'll answer it now, and then I'll hopefully re-answer it. Okay. Maybe you'll believe me the second time. So what's happening is. John, John, can I ask you? You said rotation time is two seconds? Yeah. OK. Maybe it's 1.5, but I believe that was a 30 RPM experiment. Okay. So we slightly changed the rotation rate. So yeah. I believe that's a 30 RPM case, so then two seconds. Um, so now, why didn't we go, up and go pull off some huge big plume head again? It's a really good question. So let's say the fluid's trying to spread out laterally. As it does, what's happening to it? Who's acting on it? Who's our special, who's our special friend in this system? Coriolis. And it's a really weird term, right? So as it tries to spread out horizontally, what's Coriolis doing? It's pushing it off to the side, constantly pushing it off to the side. It might want to be a big fat plume head, but instead it's just going to constantly go off to the side like a dog chasing its tail. And a dog chasing its tail typically does not have a large radius of curvature. Explained. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's the idea. Coriolis is going to wrap it around. It can't spread out very far laterally. And I'm going to come back to that point a couple of times. OK. So what's going on then in low Rossby number flow, in rotationally dominated flow, is that, actually, I want to go back here a little. Sorry, now nah, we don't, yeah. OK, so you can watch the movie, but I'm interested in looking at the forces. 
This is actually small. You need it to drive the flow, but it's actually now a weak term. These are actually relatively small. And so the only thing now that can at zeroth order balance Coriolis is pressure. Nobody else can keep up. It's actually, it ends up being in this Coriolis or rotationally dominated system, this is the big dog, and in a sense, this kind of steps up because nothing else can. Okay? It kind of just fills the gap. In that sense, it's no different than hydrostatic balance. Right? In hydrostatic, it just has to be there. Something has to be. And so this is the rotating version of that, is where only these two could possibly be in balance. I almost like to think of it as pressure not wanting to be in balance. It just has to be. Nothing else can do the job. Okay, so there's a weird result from that, which is that if you look at this equation and take the curl of it, which tells you how the fluid is swirling, or a better way to think of it is how, what are the local torques on the fluid? Then you can see the local torques, that's this equation, there, the net is zero, and the curl of a gradient, a gradient points in a direction, and a curl sweeps around. So mathematically, this is zero for a constant density fluid. So this term zero, pressure actually can't locally torque. So then we only have the curl of u cross two omega. And if we do that and do math that we don't need to do here, the only term that's non-zero is that one. The only one you have is omega, the angular velocity, which is vertical, so in the z direction, dot grad u. That has to be zero. This can't be non-zero and have this make physical sense. Omega isn't zero. U isn't zero. We just watched the movie. And so the gradient of zero has to be, the gradient of u has to be zero. So the velocity field can't change with z. You might be asking yourself, what does that mean? That doesn't mean a thing. It does. It means you're in a rapidly rotating system. Think about it. All the fluid is rotating. Everything's in solid body rotation. Everything is locally rotating with the container at 2 omega. And if there are no possible torques, if everything's tiny, then there's no way to change that background rotation. So the fluid just stays that way. Another way to say it is you've got a perfect fluid gyroscope. It's all rotating about its axis. There's nothing to torque on it, so you can't tip it. It's a perfect gyroscope. You're in the limit where there's nothing that could possibly, in any significant way, torque or push on this thing. So it's just going to stay lined up. Does that make sense? And we could talk more physically in terms of wave dynamics, but it goes much further. So then the weird result is that in this quasi-geostrophic limit, my people constantly say quasi-geostrophic. It's not exactly geostrophic because there's convection of some kind. You're breaking it a little. But you're close. You're dominated by that geostrophic balance. If you are, you expect at first order that the flow is largely going to be aligned with the axis. And then you might say, oh, well, there we go. That's why planetary magnetic fields are aligned with the axis. What does geostrophic mean? Thank you. Good. So yeah, for those of you guys also going to SETI, in the core sessions, that's all you hear people saying, quasi-geostrophic this, quasi-geostrophic that. This is what it means. It means these two terms are the lead balance, Coriolis and pressure. That's it. Geostrophy means those two are in the lead. There could be secondary balances, right? There could be some buoyancy term that's small but driving the flow. But the big dogs are these two. You get it? If pressure is the only thing that can stand up to Coriolis, that's geostrophy, and that then implies this weird alignment. Everything's lockstep with the rotation. You guys get it or get the idea? Yeah, Uli. So if you injected the dye further out towards the wall where the fluid is much more curved, would Great. it then still go? Good question. Yes, it will. It'll always, it'll, well, always, not always, but it'll always at low Rossby number. Uh, go vertically downward. So let's see it again. This one, if you remember, this one was 15 centimeters out and it was going like that before in air. But in water, it doesn't matter at all. In water, at low Rossby number, it's basically falling down. Oh, this is the next experiment. So we did a later experiment with a less shaky surface. 
let's swash it one more time. And so, actually what you can see, this guy's about halfway out. And again, before that correspondence, I forget to what the angle is, I think 15 degrees for the drop angle. But now that's not the case at all. Let's go back. You're going to see it's going to go and fall straight down. And it's swirling. It might be trying to move off to the side and spreading out. Instead, it's just getting constantly wrapped and simply falls down. That's so crazy. So when Coriolis wins, it, it's inherently eventually going to go down. And so then these break apart. We actually over-injected on that one. And so these break apart into two separate columns, but they're both lined up axially. Do you see it? And slowly it's sinking down, but very slowly. OK. So I'm going to argue at zeroth order, that looks a lot like what, what you get in Christus Soderlund's dynamo models. These are a bit like this, right? Maybe a little rougher, but it's the same idea. OK, so that's quasi-geostrophic flow. That's what's called the Taylor-Proudman theorem in action. Taylor-Proudman, again, means du dz is 0. Any questions on that? It's weird. It's weird, but it sort of strangely eerily makes sense. Yeah. I think I heard two. Go. So, so where does the sense of the column uh, come from, like uh, up, down, uh, what you know creates that? I Why is there a column at all? Directionality. No, no, up, down. Obviously, you've seen why there's a column, but there's a direction within the columns itself. Like, there's upward flow, downward flow. Is that? Good. So, <laughs> in this case, in our lab experiment, good question. There's only downward flow. In these ones, only. We're only injecting from the top. It's dense. All the flow is down. In our dynamo model, you actually have a hot inner core and a cold CMB. And so there, the fluid is actually, oh, that's a wonderful question, it's actually trying to move out radially. And so it's trying to move out radially. And as it does so, and you might even say, oh, it's trying to move out radially roughly from the equator of the inner core. Not exactly true, but mostly. But when it does, it drags an entire column with it. And if you think of, let's say, an outflow, an outflow is going to generate one vortex to the left, one to the, to the right. They're going to have opposite sign. So there you're going to have opposite sign. Here's one side. Here's the other of that outflow. They're each going to move outwards or attempt to. As they do, they'll set up different sign vortices. But those vortices are almost perfectly axially oriented. It's weird. Again, it's strange. And so you're quickly communicating. If we want to talk in time scales, the way to think of this is that we're setting off what are called inertial waves. I'm not even going to talk about them. We're sending off inertial waves that are communicating throughout the whole fluid that we're in this quasi-geostrophic limit. So as it tries to move a blob out, the blob quickly, quickly sends out these pressure waves. They're much faster than the fluid motions. And they quickly set up a column. And then that has to drag all the way out. Does that make sense? Nice one. What would you say the density difference is between what you... In the core? Uh, here, no, in, uh, in this experiment between the, ex the, the, uh, the whatever, creamer I, I can't remember. It's, it's either 3% or 5%. I have one slide where it says 3%, okay. but then I think in a different part of possibly these slides it says 5%. So Somebody I'm measured it, but I don't remember. So I want to make, uh, ask my favorite question, which is you see in this experiment that the... the that the drop does not, uh, you know, kind of equilibrate with, the, it doesn't mix with the water immediately, right? Because I've, I've been taught that in the core you can't have density differences more than 10 to the minus 6 or 9. I'd say 10 to the minus, yeah, 10 to the minus so 8 So I still don't understand. Well, okay, good, great question. So here you would argue these are still big density differences, right? It's a 5% density difference, right? Um, and we could do experiments where there are smaller density differences, but it's very easy to buy creamer. And you can see creamer easily. So I've only selected that for ease of demonstration. I know In the core, if you estimate velocities, or you have velocity estimates, if you estimate the types of buoyancy differences you need to drive those flows, then you end up at about 10 to the minus 8. Is that zero? No, it's not zero. It's a huge system. 
So even small density differences can still drive significant flows. John, maybe to answer your question, it would be helpful to you know, yeah. describe the scaling relationship between velocity, density difference, and rotation rate. Oh, that's not that easy. I would argue that's not that easy. But OK, well, let's. That's let's how you your yeah, but it's not that obvious. Um, OK, so if you want, let's say, if you're in a rotating system, then you have velocity scales roughly as the buoyancy flux over 2 omega to the 1 half. OK? It's called a thermal wind balance. And if you now estimate the velocities in the core, you can then back out what's the buoyancy flux. And that buoyancy flux depends on you know, some delta rho over rho. And it also, so, so then the point we get is that when you invert for that delta rho, it's tiny. And there's honestly not a very good way to make it much larger. So in astrophysical and geophysical systems, the density differences will always remain rather small in low viscosity fluids such as these. In a mantle where it's highly viscous, yeah, then you can have huge temperature differences. But in the core, as you go to almost an inviscid fluid, there's really no way to beat this relationship. And there's no great way out of it, honestly. So I don't see. When I, when, when I play with that equation, I'm stuck at delta rho over rho is about 10 to the minus 8. And delta rho is about 10 to the minus 4 kilograms per cubic meter. So that is a big difference between a lab experiment and something on the scale of a planet. Does that make sense? There's no way out of that. As you go to, as you go to this large scale and these relatively slow velocities in the core, you can't invert this equation for anything but a relatively small delta rho. OK? John, if I can just ask a quick follow-up question. If you were to inject a dye into the outer core that was 3% denser. It would be awesome. What would happen to it? it would, would, we'd have cranked our amp up to 11. It would be huge. The flows would be massive. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd probably would it organize itself into a Taylor column? Oh, it matters. So that's such a high density difference that you would probably. So one, I just want to get in your guys' heads. You're, in my humble opinion, you're in in asking that question. We're kind of misscaling a lab experiment to a planet, right? We're just trying to set up a flow here to show the ideas at low Rossby number. If you actually put in such a huge density gradient in a core most likely you would set up a high Rossby number flow, which is very different from core dynamics. Rotation wouldn't matter that much, and you'd just have different physics. You'd get much higher velocities, so much so that you'd probably change regime. OK, so you, honestly, so you wouldn't spread it in. Oh, no, no. Zone. It okay. would just be a mess. Cool, yeah. thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, So um, you know this, this buoyancy flux you're talking about here is it primarily thermal or chemical? Or, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Doesn't matter. Just but it has to be part of the dynamic system, right? Yeah. It's simple. Look again. It's just delta rho over rho. You could get that delta rho over rho from a temperature anomaly, from a chemical anomaly. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it's in there. Something's there in so, this case to drive. So if flow. it's a chemical, uh, if it's due to compositional anomaly, so you're talking about maybe due to the differentiation of the inner core. It can be either. Yes. I'm curious, um, what determines how many columns you have around the equator? Whoa, I didn't have that in today's talk. I'll put that in tomorrow. Um, it actually scales, it arguably scales with the viscosity in the fluid near onset. And that gives you an incredibly small number. Then if the flow becomes turbulent, that scale can increase. And the size that it then equilibrates at is still up for grabs. But it can get a bit, a bit larger. Even though it gets larger, I would argue it's still small. There still should probably be 1,000 columns or so in the core. OK? So much smaller than LMAX. Sorry, what, much larger number of columns 
than basically the number of spherical harmonics we, we have. So we can't observe these directly, is what it appears. Does that make sense? So they're tiny. Yeah? So your answer to Barbara's density question relied on knowing core velocities. Could you say a couple of words about how on earth we know what the velocity of fluid is in the core? So let me keep going, because I have that later on. Okay? That comes back to MHD. Okay, good questions. Let me roll forward. Make sure I answer your question when I get to those slides. Okay, so now I still want to just get in your heads that we have these columnar flows and that they're helical motions. And I'm going to say that matters because I think that matters in dynamo systems. So what we saw so far is we put in a dense anomaly. It's pretty big so that we can see things happening in our lab experiment. Smaller in the core, but we expect the same physics. What we saw, though, was that the density anomaly modestly breaks Taylor Proudman. It's quasi-geostrophy. It breaks geostrophy, but just a little. And so it slowly falls. As these up and down welling flows occur, we also expect to see swirling motion with it because almost any lateral motion will get converted into a rotational motion okay? by Coriolis. So let's show that. Let's do yet another experiment. This one's by Sam May. We're looking down on a rotating table, and we're just going to look at particle dynamics here to get the idea for why you'd get circles. So this is a parabolic table. Why is it a parabolic table? It's a parabolic table that's shaped to, I think, a 12 RPM rotation rate. On that surface then, just as we talked about before, there are no horizontal forces. So any motion we see then in the rotating frame is just going to be inertia versus Coriolis. In the inertial, in the, sorry, in the rotating frame. In the inertial frame, it's kind of a mess. If we look at this experiment in the inertial frame, it just looks like a weird oscillator, right? You might say, oh, it's easy. It's just an oscillator. It's not that easy. It's actually not a perfect, normal, simple harmonic oscillation. So it's pretty hard to solve. But if you transform that movie, and this is what Sam did. Sam wrote a program that transforms a movie from lab frame into the rotating frame. So this is the exact same movie, but in Python, Sam has now transformed into the rotating frame. And when you do that, ooh, you get circles. Cool. So in the rotating frame, where I'm arguing that's where all the physics makes sense in rotating systems, you get these beautiful circles. That's all you see. Why is that? So let's go through it. Why is that? That's because now we just have inertia in this system balancing Coriolis. That's it. So there's a velocity, and it's constantly pushed off to its right. And so if you think about that, one, we can scale that. We can, once again, do u grad u, or you can think of it as center, centripetal versus Coriolis, and you get u squared over some radius of curvature. This is called the inertial radius. It's balanced by Coriolis. And so if we just solve for that radius, you see the radius goes as u over 2 omega. So we measure the velocity in the rotating frame. Nothing else is going on in this system. It has to be a circle. And so that circle radius is fixed. So if you tried to have, let's now apply this to a fluid system. For some given velocity, unlike in a classic plume system, here it's going to try to spread out. But as it spreads, it's going to hit some radius where it's just stuck. It has to go around. It can no longer spread further for the velocity it has. Does that make sense? So you're going to limit everything based on this Coriolis constraint. Is everybody with me on that one? It's weird, but that is what's happening. And so a way to think of it is it's a bit like a gyro radius for people who work with mass specs. There you have a charged particle going into a magnetic field. When you do, you get a V cross B. Well, that's always off to the right. And before you know it, you've chosen a radius of curvature that you're bending your charged particle through. You usually catch it before it goes in a full circle, right? Here, we don't have anything to catch anything. So here is the mechanical analog to a gyro radius, and things just go in circles very naturally. That's the natural mode in these rotating systems for horizontal motions. So, we get these inertial radii, and now what Sam did in his program, I like this, he tracks the particle when you feed it the movie, you pick the particle, his program then tracks it. 
And as he tracks it, he calculates u, and then he calculates u over 2 omega. And so the blue dots will be his, his tr ball tracks, and the white lines are his real, you know, in a sense, his predictions from theory for what the radius of curvature should be. And it's not that far off. It's pretty good. And so there's something cool. You might say, hey, but the radii are getting smaller a little bit. Maybe they're this and that. Yeah, they are. There's friction on the table. So the radius is constantly growing shorter. If I took a really long movie, it would, and then it would just stop. Does that make sense? Presumably some initial horizontal velocity. Yeah, sorry. So there has to be. Right. You're right. Uh, let's see. Let's see what. Yeah, so I didn't show it. That's because I'm a bad person. I forgot to show it. So um, Sam has basically placed it on the table at t equals zero. I started the movie just after that. But yes, if we simply, here's the hard part. It's hard to actually force Sam to place it at 2 omega. If you place it perfectly at 2 omega, it'll just sit there. Because yeah. gravity will balance Coriol uh, centrifugal. But when you just kind of plop it down, it's not. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so if you're not a complete <laughs> genius at placing the ball down, you're always going to get some velocity relative to the rotating frame. As soon as you have that, you're going to get these circles. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so neat. OK, great. Yeah, neat, neat. Got it. All right. OK, so we always get circular motions whenever we look horizontally. We can predict those radii. Yep, there they are. And if we look at just something like the ocean, here's a nice, just an image from a movie from this massive NASA model plus data simulation. And this is the flow you see in the Atlantic. These are streak lines. And you see tons of circular motions. And so that's a really pretty large inertial radius. If you go to higher latitude, if you remember, we haven't gone through this, but Coriolis on a thin layer goes to zero at the equator. Or really, the projection of omega goes to zero at the equator. And it goes to omega at the poles. So if we look back, apologies, should have put this on here. Yeah. If we look back at our formula for inertial radii, it's u over 2 omega. But this is where I'm at the North Pole. But on a planet at the equator, the projection of this is going towards zero. So as this gets smaller, Coriolis basically is weaker, and I'm going to have to have a larger radius for a given velocity to come around in a loop. Do you get it? It's a weaker restore, really off to the right restoring force. So as I go towards the equator, the prediction, sorry, sorry, go, go. The prediction would be, as you go towards the equator, these are going to get pretty big. And as you go towards the poles, these are going to shrink in size. Are they shrinking in size? Yeah, they are. So you see this all over oceanography, OK? You might see one other thing. We also see jets, whoever asked me about it. When the, these flows run into boundaries, you often get sharp jets. And we'll talk about that in a bit. OK, so now let's look again at this movie. We crank in some density anomaly. It falls. Can you see any swirling? Watch where it hits the bottom. Any net swirl? A little bit. It's kind of hard to see, actually. But these are helices. I'm going to try and prove it to you one more time. One more question. Yeah, please. That, that too can only happen because Two. When you put that drop in, there's some horizontal velocity just by accident, or right? I mean, wait, if there's wait, sorry, I lost you. You're if there's about the no, radius? if there's no horizontal velocity of that f falling uh, creamer or whatever, yeah, it it should just fall, right? I mean, you would, you're correct. So if it perfectly falls exactly downwards, you won't excite any swirl. However, typically there's some accelerations. Sure. So as it accelerates even a little, or decelerates, it doesn't matter, that in an incompressible fluid, that's sucking fluid in as it accelerates. Or when it decelerates, it's pushing out. And when it pushes out, it's going to swirl one way. When it sucks in, it's going to go the other. 
So now that you mention it, it's, you're typically going to have one sign of vorticity of swirl at the top and the other at the bottom, where it, let's say, accelerates and then decelerates when it hits a boundary. Does that make sense? And actually, let's see if we can see it. I think you might be able to see that. I think as it's going to come out, it's going to accelerate a little, swirl one way. It's going to hit the bottom, diverge from that bottom surface, and hopefully it'll then swirl the other way. So it's swirling, I'm arguing this way at the top, that way at the bottom. Don't know if you can see it, but let's do one more to try to beat that into people's heads. Let's do one more experiment. Why not? So here's a record player, and I've put my old cell phone uh, in the rotating frame, above the fluid, in a plastic bag, because I'm dumb but not stupid, right? <laughs> so it's in the rotating frame. Then John Chang, I said, oh, take a movie of that with your cell phone. So he took a movie of that on the side. That's our setup. We've got about 10 centimeters of water. It's rotating at 17 RPM. It has been for 10 minutes. So it's all spun up. And now what I'm going to do is take just green food coloring, put it in a little mister, and I'm going to mist it onto the surface. When it mists, I've now got a dense boundary layer. And maybe it's not a geophysically realistic density difference, but if I put in 10 to the minus 8, it wouldn't matter. Nothing would happen in the lab, actually. It would just sit there, right? Or we'd have to wait for years. So I'm going to put in some rather dense fluid at the top, and here's my view from that camera in the rotating frame. And it's first out of focus, and then I reached in and focused it. And so we just put on the die. You could see it's actually falling downwards. Our view is topward. Here I'm about to go. Come on, focus. Yeah. Good. And you can see everything's swirling. So you're looking down on columnar plumes. But when you look just from above, all you see swirls. Do you get it? And over time, these kind of become focused. And you can now kind of see it's a, you're looking down on a projection of a vertical column of fluid. But associated at the top and the bottom, I don't have any dye there anymore, are these swirling motions. You get it? So these are axial helices. I understand. I'm confused. If the, if the camera's in the rotating frame, why do we see something rotating at the bottom? You're, you're on Great. a rotating table. You're looking from above. I'm Great so question. confused. W what do you see rotating, actually? I don't know. Light. I cannot rotate the lights on the ceiling. Oh, I'm well, I'm, so UCLA might be able to do that for you. Well, no, but you just asked a great question. You just asked one of the classic questions. This is why in the earlier experiments, we put the light panel in the rotating frame so that you don't naturally go, this isn't working. You naturally say that when you see something rotating in the frame. You go, no, 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 no. You're in the wrong frame. We're not in the wrong frame. We're in the rotating frame. It's that we can't, for this one, we didn't put the lights in the rotating frame. So then it's confusing. Thank you. Make sense? Yeah. Any others? Yeah, Barbara. It seems there is like a scale, a, a spatial scale to these yeah. columns. What's that? Oh, so mean? it's for this, it's Ekman to the one third. So I mentioned the Ekman number earlier. Hi. Hi. We'll do your side. Um, so the Ekman number. Um, I'll do this, actually, I'll do this tomorrow because I'm getting a lot of good questions on that scale, and it is the right question. So if you look at the horizontal scale, we'll call it L. L is the scale between these two, these two centers. That L goes as about Ekman to the one-third of the height of the layer. So Ekman, if you remember, well, I don't think I ever defined it, it's the viscosity over 2 omega times the height squared. And again, you can think of it as the rotation time over the viscous diffusion time. Um, or you can think of it as the viscous force over the Coriolis force. And so in Earth's core, this is about 10 to the minus 15. So 10 to the minus 15 to the 1 third is 10 to the minus 5. Ooh. So even though we've got a big core that's about 2,000 kilometers deep, if you do 10 to the minus 5 times that, you end up with maybe 20 meter or 100 meter separations. Tiny. You, you don't. 
I don't think you do. And so we'll talk about that tomorrow. The present models are built on really big structures because Ekman is kind of comparable to what we see here. Even on the best computers, it's not that easy to get past this. I'll show you an image or two of a model that does. But it's not that easy to get past this. If this is the Ekman number, take that to the one third. I don't know what the hell you get. But it's not that many columns. It's maybe 20 or 100 on a good day. In Earth's core, if we use this same physics, we're talking about 100,000. That's a lot. So we'll talk about that tomorrow as we talk about how you generate magnetic fields. Are the columns going to be arranged in some sort of lattice? Or is it regular? Are they, are they arranged in a lattice here? I don't know. Oh, I think that's a pretty regular lattice. That's unbearably regular. If we took an FFT, we'd be psyched, right? <laughs> we could do a 2D FFT. We could do it in both directions. We'd be spiking our computer, right? We'd have a beautiful peak not that far off from an Ekman to the one-third scale. I've done it in class. Um, and actually, everyone hated the FFT, but they liked the result. <laughs> so yes, I would argue that is a well-organized lattice. I don't have it with me. If we do a bigger tank, you just get a bigger lattice. And so now you've asked a good question, though. What happens when I add, let's say, oh, I may get there. What happens when we add boundary anomalies? Maybe you start to sculpt that lattice. Maybe you add large-scale changes. Maybe it's those large scales we see in the magnetic field. And that's a nice direction in terms of core mantle, or really just core rest of the Earth coupling, inner core or mantle. OK? Any other questions on this? All right. OK. So now you asked, is it regular in a, in a planet? I don't exactly know. But I do have a result from my collaborator, Thomas Gastine. He's done some of the lowest Ekman number models. Again, in Earth's core, it's 10 to the minus 15. This is really the state of the art for supercomputing right, right now. Hopefully, we'll get lower. And you might say, why? Why do you need to get lower? We need to get lower because we're still eight orders of magnitude away. We don't need to do all eight, but we need to make sure we're in an asymptotic regime. And it's not totally clear we're there yet. Um, a lot of arguments will change as these structures get smaller. Just what Barbara asked, can these describe the field? Not individually. And yet, in the models from even a couple of years ago, and the schematic I showed, it's columns that are explaining the flux patches. So I'll talk about that, I think, tomorrow. Good but question. what you see here Good is question. a huge number of structures. Yep, go. So what makes it hard to have low Ekman numbers in numerical simulations? Aren't the computers going to just shove numbers in there and you're good? <laughs> no. Um, computing is still, we have fabulous supercomputers nowadays. And yet, this is a 4D problem. And um, the smallest length scale here in this problem goes as typically Ekman to the 1 half. So, Ekman to the 1 half is about almost 10 to the minus 4 here, which means we need a range of scales of about 10 to the 4. Oh, 10 to the 4 in, in all directions. And then the smaller that spacing, the smaller our time step. And before you know it, you've taken up smoking. <laughs> horrible. It's horrible, right? And it's, it's miserable. So, so it's really expensive. This is the state of the art. Um, Hopefully, again, in the next year or two, we'll, we'll, we're always, you're always hearing people mutter, oh, if we could get lower. And there's a whole bunch of physics missing in these models. There's a great deal we're getting. But for instance, none of these models, in my opinion, are yet in metal. You can't do a metal. It's more like kind of a waterish material. And it just happens to be a water that's nearly superconducting. So it's, it's a little hard to get these to work with realistic materials still. So they're not rotating fast enough. They're rotating pretty damn fast, but probably not fast enough. And the material properties are still off. And that's just expensive. OK. And you know what you might say is, it's kind of like these are turbulent systems. It's rapidly rotating turbulence, but it's turbulence. And just like in engineering turbulence, really hard to resolve it realistically. So go talk to the engineers as well, and they'll all go, oh my god, it's so expensive. Does that make sense? So what do you see here? You do see, I think, a fairly well-organized lattice. 
right? Our experiments are comparable to the pole here, and you see up and down wellings with maybe swirlies. You're saying how the Coriolis force stops things from moving. Is there any lateral movement, or is everything just stuck where it starts when, it stop, when it's rotating? Good question. So it didn't say it stops things from moving. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it's a, oh, crap. Eh, let's not go there. Um, it's a U cross omega term, right? So it actually doesn't do any work on the fluid at all. It simply pushes things off to the side. And it tends to want to align them. It doesn't stop them. That's different than stopping. Right? It simply converts energy into this highly anisotropic, swirly set of columnar motions. But I want to get that, that idea across. It doesn't actually stop them. It may make it harder for them to occur, but once they're going, they're going. They're just highly anisotropic. And I think you see that anisotropy in Tomas image as well. Right? If it wasn't rotating, this would all be spherically symmetric. It's absolutely not spherically symmetric. Right? And so you might say, if you just looked at this, you'd say, oh, just classic 2D convection, a bunch of plumes. They are. It's a bunch of plumes coming this way and going that way. And yet each of those plumes drags a whole column of fluid. Does that make sense? Is it well organized? I think so. Is there a difference in organization in the equatorial region than in the polar region? Again, I think so, yeah. There are differences there as well. OK, so let's just take a quick look. Here's Tomas' temperature field image near the pole. And here's a snapshot from our lab experiment. You can't see as well in the temperature field the swirlies, but these are comparable flow fields. Have I sold that or that idea? Any questions on it? OK, great. Great. OK, so now that for me is the basic physics in rapidly rotating, uh, I'd say convection systems in this case. There's lots of other physics we could talk about, but that'll do for getting helical columns and dynamo models. Now, if we have any other questions, any other questions on dynamics, basic dynamics? Good. OK, so now on to core coupling. And to do that, maybe no surprise, I'm still going to return back to the taylor proudman theorem. We're going to talk once more about this. But we're going to add a boundary anomaly to this system. So now I've got, yet again, a record player. Much better movie than what I'm going to show here is online that John Bridgman made. Um, and it's got music. Um, and so we put a little copper hockey puck in the bottom about halfway out in radius. You guys see it? So it's about. This layer is about, I think it's, yeah, it's 20 centimeter tall fluid layer. This is about a centimeter and a half tall, and I don't know, maybe four centimeters across. Everybody see it? Okay. So we're going to do a rotating experiment, and we're going to release some dye off to the side of it, and then we're going to slightly change the rotation rate of the table. The fluid won't really notice. What will really happen is, the puck really will just start slowly moving through the fluid. Do you get it? So it's all rotating at omega. Tiny change to the rotation rate of the record player will slowly drag that puck through. And if it's at very low Rossby number, which it is, it's the Rossby number is about uh, 0.01, then we expect all the fluid dynamics to remain invariant in Z. So let's see what happens. OK, so we've got a side view in the upper left, and we have a top view in the right. So one thing you can see, we put in the die, and actually Coriolis doesn't even let the die sink all the way. So it's up here, and now we change the rotation rate by drop of the table, and the die won't go over the puck. It diverges around the puck at all heights. Whoa. Whoa. You can, you can record that. Whoa. What the hell is going on? That's Taylor Proudman again, right? And so, yeah, Matt Jackson was saying, why didn't you bring the damn table? It's, it's fun when you do it yourself, too, because then it's really visceral. But what's happening here is you're at zeroth order maintaining a balance between Coriolis and pressure. Nothing else can really torque on the fluid. So when the fluid slowly tries to pass over 
this puck, it can't. It kicks off basically pressure waves that much more quickly than the fluid keep going upwards and acting kind of as a barrier that the fluid has to go around. So flow really interacts strongly with topography in a rapidly rotating system. Can I show you that one more time? It's drugs. It's spooky. So again, it's weird. It doesn't even fall all the way through. We're rotating fast enough here and using a lower density die. It just doesn't even sink. It sinks part way and then it becomes in adjustment. And then when we try to have it go over the puck, won't do it. Not having any part of it. You'll see also there's something cool here. The tank isn't exactly level, so there's a gravity wave. The gravity wave is fast. The gravity wave is occurring on the same time scale as the rotation. That gravity wave motion, I'm going to show it one more time. That gravity wave motion is 3D. It's kind of setting off these helical motions. If you can see it a little, maybe. See that? See, whoa, whoa, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Those are kind of doing that. Those are 3D, but the slow flow, 2D. Just a detail, but is the puck moving with yeah. everything, or is it fixed? Okay, so sorry, I should have explained that slightly better. So we've got, we've got DJ tables, and so with a DJ table, what you can do is you can set the rotation rate, and so we set it at, let's say, 33 RPM, and then you can change it. We hit a button, and it changes to, uh, it was like 32.5. And so it instantaneously changes by just a tiny amount. The fluid's going to take 10 minutes to notice that. The puck notices instantly because it's attached to the bottom. So the puck starts slowly moving through the fluid, which in our world is the same as the fluid trying to pass over the puck. When it tries to pass, it drags this vertical column with it. Remember I said a, 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 you know, when you try to set off a plume from the equator, it's going to drag fluid with it in a column? That's what you're seeing here in a different world. Here it's topographic. So that's faster than the flow wave. Why is that the case? Uh, say that again. So that's faster than the falling. Falling, right? That's faster than the uh, die trying to fall. Ah, good. So that's here the... we've made the die a little lower density. One, it's not even falling very well. It falls about halfway, and then actually Coriolis locks it up. So you said sometimes it stops motion. It slowed it down a lot. It's come into what's called geostrophic adjustment in this case. So maybe I lied to you earlier. It can and sometimes actually, in some cases, it can actually stop the flow. So it falls part way, and then you can really not worry about it as falling. You can just think of it as a tracer in the upper half of the tank. And that's perfect because it's so weird that tracer in the upper half is getting out of the way of topography at the bottom. That's spooky. Does that make sense? Or I don't know if it makes sense, but do you see the demo? That, I mean, that's part of it. Part of it is just, okay, you've seen it. You don't have to believe it. But that is what's happening. Yeah, Shiji. So, John, uh, since you actually uh, mentioned this core minor boundary uh, here, and I was wondering, uh, you know, for the real Earth, uh, since you mentioned the core, the flu feature is so small, of uh, such small length scale, uh, so what kind of uh, core minor boundary topography, uh, you know, sort of length scale that actually uh, you need in order to make this It's a good question. So we need it to be outside of the boundary layers. So the Ekman layer in the core, if it's the molecular viscosity, is maybe 50 centimeters. If it's turbulent, maybe it's a kilometer, maybe. So if core mantle topography or inner core topography is of order a kilometer or two, it's kind of strongly. How about the horizontal scale? What do you mean by horizontal? Yeah, uh, horizontal scale, good question. Um, I think it's the same argument. I think it's still going to be. Uh, no, actually, horizontally, it doesn't matter if it's on the Ekman layer scale. That's a good question. I, I actually I kind of don't know. I don't know what the lower bound is. I know the you'll trip off structures uh, on the order of raw speed of the 1 half in width. But how narrow do you have to be to do that? I actually don't know that. We should ask Mike Calkins. I think he would argue it doesn't matter. Honestly, it could be a very thin fin. But I've never done the experiment. But when I channel my inner Mike Calkins, I would say thin fin would work. Thin fin, so it could be Ekman layer thickness. So very thin and just greater than uh, the layer, the height of the Ekman layer. So let's, let's look then. So here, 
Let's look at Mike Hawkins' paper from 2012. What he did, he added a topographic ridge. Um, so it's going down along a line of longitude. And it's a Gaussian. It's pretty broad. It's very deep. Why is it deep? It's deep because the Ekman number is not very high. right? The Ekman number here is 10 to the minus 6. If we made it 10 to the minus 15, it could be tiny. And so the two co-scale. Here is pretty deep, though, but we just want to show the physics. Here we're looking at the Z vorticity. It's convecting in the equatorial plane. So blue are rotating like that. Red are rotating like that. Okay, It's not temperature. It's vorticity. It's how the fluid is swirling. And so here there's no ridge. I'm going to do another differencing experiment. No ridge, and let's just see the motion. So you get these vortices, and there's a lot of zonal motion. So there is some jet-like motion here. A lot of it's around lines of fixed, you could say, latitude. But if you average in time, these are the streamlines where all the material is moving over a diffusion time or two averaged. You can see everything's perfectly axisymmetric. There was no special location, no nothing. Everything's just going around. The stuff near the inner core is going uh, westward, and the stuff near the outer boundary at the equator is going eastward. OK, now let's add a ridge. And so there's that ridge. It's over at 90 degrees, or at whatever that is, 9 o'clock. Um, it's right there, and it's right there as well in the, in the time average streamlines. And now you can see, on time average, this has created special locations. There are regions where there tend to be vorticity. So we've created this little blocker for flow. It sure as hell doesn't like that blocker. And it's going to try to scoot in to get away from it near the inner core boundary. So we focus the flow near the ICB in this model. And that generates a bunch of Lee waves behind the ridge. Let's see if we can see it. And you might say, oh, it's hard to see. Yeah, this is complex flow. Rapidly rotating, we're looking at an equatorial slice through these columns. But it's still complex. And what I want you to notice is, for instance, in this movie, there's a special location right there. It's just stuck. Very sharp jet right there where fluid tends to sneak over the topography. And then it forms a vortex in the lee of the topography. You see that? So when you time average, you get these structures. Let's look again. And you would argue, yeah, there's kind of a special, look at that. It's really being focused right there. And then it back circulates behind that. So you might argue if you look for, if this flow is tied to magnetic field structure, then you might naively argue, OK, there'll be semi-fixed magnetic structure with respect to the mantle if these vortices are tied to mantle physics, or sorry, to dynamo physics. OK, so now I think this is Jessica's question, was how do we know anything about flow in the core? Yeah. Sorry, just to clarify, were, that, were those equatorial slices that you're showing? It's actually an equatorial model. Okay. So it's called a quasi-geostrophic model. And so what we've assumed here, here, let me go back. I was too brief because I'm four minutes from done. So what we did was we actually assumed that all the flows are on these columns, and we just collapsed it down to the equator. We conserve vorticity along these long columns, but we only solved in the equatorial plane. So everything is, is effectively quasi 2D. So it's a 2D calculation, but we're assuming these structures live in a 3D shell. Does that make sense? Can, can you explain again what the topography is, what the ridge is? Yes. I think so understood. I can't draw it very well. That was the best. We, it's not the greatest. So it's a Gaussian ridge, and we've simply added um, a Gaussian ridge of constant height running from basically the equator down to the inner core. We stopped solving at the inner core boundary. We can't solve in there. It's two 3D. It's, oh, it's not 2D in there. So it's like a road bump in the middle? Yes, it is. It's a road bump, but it's a road bump that we've flattened along a spherical surface. right? So we, we've, we've taken our road bump. Think of a flexible road bump, and think of a road that's hemispherical. <laughs> and now lay that road bump on top of your hemisphere. 
Do you get it? So if it was just a hemisphere. It's like a banked road. Yes, well, but yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's better than whatever the hell I just said. So, <laughs> so if you just have a spherical surface, you get this. And you might say, oh, why is everything going around? Because this doesn't really want to move out. It would change height as it moves out spherically. But there's no non-axisymmetric topography. This is just spherical topography. While here, in addition to a sphere, I've laid my road bump on top, too. And it's right over there. So it's Gaussian constant spreading angle. And that was just the easiest model to do. Does that make sense? You can see it's a little nasty. No, 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 no. No, I'm just showing you where it is. And then you don't see it except in the flow field in that it locks a big what's called lee Rossby wave behind it. And so it kind of locks the flow on time average to the bump. Okay. Now if we look at models of, going quickly, if we look at models of core flow, this is, I would argue, still probably the leading model in recent years. It's from Alexandra Pais and Dominique Jo. And what they show is they actually find there's a sharp jet near the inner core boundary with a recirculation right there, right there next to it. And what they're doing to estimate core flow, we can't see the flow in the core. So instead, they invert magnetic field measurements. They me we measure the magnetic field over time. And then we assume that if the advection of magnetic field is much greater than diffusion, then we argue on short time scales, the magnetic field flux bundles correspond to fluid bundles. And so we turn magnetic variations over time into flow. Are there a lot of caveats there? Yeah, that's really hard to do. Yes? So in this model, topography has been imposed instantaneously. No, here, in this this model from Pei and Joe. Oh, I'm talking about the numerical model. model. Yeah. Boom. Can you comment on the growth or destruction of topography with time and how the system responds? No. Um, in ours, it's simply set. You know, again, the core motions are so fast with respect to any mantle motions that this model is literally running for. I don't know, maybe 10,000 rotations. 10,000 rotations, a couple of years. I don't think there's significant changes in CMB topography on year-like time scales. You get it? Yeah, Torsten. Should I worry more about the topography or about the heat flow variations at the CMB? Uh, that's a good question. Can I get to that in a minute? Can I go on to my next slide? Because I'm formally, I'm in the questions section now. So there's a model from Pei and Zhou. I'm going to argue a zeroth order works pretty well with a topographic ridge. Um, there's another idea, Torsten's idea. Right? You nailed it. Perfect timing. So there's another way to do this. We could also put a cold slab somewhere on our boundary, in this case on the CMB. That will also change the pressure field. Right? We're changing the density in the fluid, changing the pressure field. This also in some ways, acts a little bit like a ridge. It's different. Here what happens is, I'm going to go to an image from their experiment. We're looking down on, from above, equatorial view through their hemisphere. No ridge here, no topographic ridge, just a heat flux anomaly right here. And what it does is, it tries to send flow inwards, it gets tweaked off to the right, and then spirals in in a jet. So we again get a jet flow, but here it's going from the CMB all the way down to the ICB. And so they argued that that cold slab's under Asia and that that best fits the observations. I'm going to twist it off to match roughly where we put our topographic anomaly to match Pei and Zhou. And if we now put that there, you might say, eh, it doesn't work as well. It's not terrible, though. Here's where there's fast flow. Here's where their jet is impinging on the CMB. Perfect. No. You might ask, well, what happens if you have a thermotopographic ridge? 
No one's done it. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. We might do it. It would be easier in the lab, I think, right now than numerically. In time, it'll be a beautiful numerical experiment. But what I then want to get at is if you add those two together, maybe it's a moderately good agreement with Pei and Zhou. And so then maybe there's a thermotopographic anomaly somewhere Farallon-esque. Does that fit? Uh, maybe. Maybe there's something interesting over there. You could argue that's what we're, that's what we're requesting. Dynamically, we're saying maybe is there a topographic jump over there? And is there some gradient in heat flux that matters? I don't know. I have tr it's not that easy for me to make that step. I also don't actually know dynamically what a dual thermotopographic anomaly would do. It's pretty rich. You're setting off jets in two different directions at once in two different locations. Pretty rich. Why there? Yeah, I'm not, that kind of makes me a little... Hmm. Why there? Why is there only one dominant anomaly? Why wouldn't there be... If it was in these gradient regions, why aren't there other gradient regions that matter? I can't answer that. Okay. Um, John, I think we need to stop. Then, then you have a chance to continue tomorrow. <laughs> Can I just really quickly address that one? So lastly, you could put an ICB anomaly from a translating inner core. That's M equals 1, and that produces something like this. And in the dynamics community, I would argue people still right now think that's the best model. So seismically, you guys think that's the worst model? Please say it louder. Right? I'd love there to be more communication between dynamicist twisting knobs and data from other communities. Okay? So, thank you. I'm done. So, may I ask that we move quickly to uh, take the picture so there is time to take coffee before we reconvene at 11? <laughs>